Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, new episode of the Robustly Beneficial uh, podcast. Uh, so today we're going to uh, discuss uh, uh, an important topic on social media, which is uh, misinformation in general, and in particular in the case for uh, vaccination. Uh, there's a uh, well, there are regular debates on the internet uh, between uh, pro and anti-vaccination views, and there's a recent paper uh, in Nature that uh, analyzes uh, this, uh, this debate and in particular how different communities interact on this debate depending on whether they are pro, anti or uh, undecided. Uh, and uh, this is a very, like I think it's a very important topic, uh, especially with the COVID situation where um, like it's been argued by many uh, uh, many, many uh, biologists, uh, epidemiologists, uh, medical doctors, that uh, the, uh, the, the main way, maybe the only way the, out of this uh, pandemic so that we can really uh, have a normal life uh, again is uh, if uh, there's a vaccine, uh, um, uh, well, a solid vaccine, a reliable vaccine that's developed but also it needs to be implemented, uh, it needs to be accepted by uh, the general public uh, because if we want to reach a herd immunity, uh, probably at least uh, 60%, if not uh, a lot more, of the population should be vaccinated. Uh, and this means that if there are like 30 or 40% of people who are skeptical and don't want to vaccinate themselves, uh, then we may have an ongoing uh, endemic, as it's called, uh, meaning that uh, the coronavirus may become uh, seasonal or, or may come again and again uh, every year, in which case uh, it would lead up to, to, to potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of deaths uh, uh, per year. Yeah, so as they say, uh, providing good information concerning vaccines is... Uh, it's a question of a, it's a life or death situation, uh, and uh, and this is why the this this paper is quite quite striking by the the numbers it tells us concerning uh, vaccine misinformation that are e extremely high and uh, quite surprising. So what they did in the in, in the study consisted in uh, analyzing uh, Facebook pages. So how many members have the each page on Facebook has, and uh, how do they link? towards one another. And uh, for this, they classify the, the, the pages into three categories, the anti-vaxxers, the pro-vaxxers. So pages for pro-vaccination -vac are pages like the Gates Foundation, uh, WHO page. And also uh, the majority of the pages were in the category undecided, where undecided were groups that have talked about vaccines, but without taking any clear side on, uh, on their stance uh, towards vaccine. So for this, they cite, for example, uh, parents' association uh, for, for schools uh, or similar things. And uh, the first thing we, we see that could be the reason why uh, it's quite surprising to, to, to see these numbers of, uh, of the scale of misinformation is that these pages are separated in, a, in two very distinct clusters. There is the cluster of uh, pro-vaccination content, the cluster of anti-vaccination content. And if you are in, the, in one, one of these two, two clusters, you most likely nearly never see content from the other cluster. So this is the concept known as uh, filter bubbles uh, pushed by, uh, by recommended systems. And uh, so finally to say the, the, the numbers out of all these pages, they, they found that uh, the, the, the pages concerning anti-vaccination that they had contained uh, about five, five million uh, uh, members and the pages for pro-vaccination contained about seven million, uh, million members. So, but what I found surprising is that it was approximately the, the, the same amount on, uh, on, on both sides. So nearly 50-50 split even though the, the scientific consensus on vaccine is uh, there is no 50-50 split on that. There is a vast, vast majority of, uh, of scientists, except one or two exceptions that, uh, that consider vaccine to be extremely useful. Yeah, uh, the, the scales are, are, are pretty huge. Like it's a study uh, of uh, 
that, that involves like clusters that add up to uh, hundreds of millions of, of individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, what they did in the study is they, they particularly uh, studied uh, the interactions between different clusters. So a cluster is like a Facebook page and uh, what they call uh, an interaction or a link is when um, a, a given uh, Facebook page uh, shares a, a link towards another Facebook page. Uh, and uh, this allows to see how the different uh, clusters interact with one another. And sort of the question we may ask is, uh, uh, well, what do most undecided pages link to? Uh, and how, this, like how, how does these clusters, like in my, can imagine you have a graph now, like uh, uh, some, some clusters we, we link to some clusters that link to other clusters and you have this graph that is connected in a certain way. And one thing they did is to try to, to visualize uh, this graph uh, by uh, a very simple model where essentially each cluster is like naturally repelled to one another except for links that pull them uh, together. And uh, like you can imagine that this dynamic, this simulated dynamic uh, creates uh, like large clusters of clusters. And what they observed is that uh, there were essentially like three big uh, clusters of clusters uh, created this way. Uh, two, two of them are somewhat uh, with the uh, pro-vaccination, like more dominated by pro-vaccination than anti-vaccination uh, Facebook pages. Uh, but they are also uh, smaller uh, clusters of clusters. And there's one bigger cluster of clusters uh, where you have uh, most of the Facebook pages. And this one is uh, actually um, dominated. It's like well infiltrated. Uh, that's sort of like the visual impression you can get by looking at the image uh, by the anti-vaccination uh, Facebook pages. So it's like the anti-vaccination anti pages, even though there are uh, fewer of them, and even though each of them is, is also smaller in size, like uh, they tend to be smaller, whereas like the pro-vaccination pages tend to be very large. Well, these anti-vaccination pages are somewhat better connected to undecided nodes. And uh, this may explain why uh, currently uh, these anti-vaccination group are growing faster uh, than the pro-vaccination groups. Yeah, just to correct on what you just said, uh, actually the, the anti-vaccination pages contain less members, so slightly less members, but they, they are more pages. So the, yeah. there are more numerous pages uh, talking about anti-vaccination than, uh, than pro-vaccination. And this was quite a big difference, like there is between two and three times more anti-vaccine pages than, uh, than pro-vaccination. Yeah. Yes, so it's uh, quite interesting, like in a sense, like there's uh, an ongoing war or, or battle, uh, maybe war is too, too strong of a word, but there's, there's an ongoing battle on the internet for on, the, on this debate. And uh, you can really almost see these uh, as uh, territories that uh, the different sides are trying to conquer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what's sort of nice with this paper is that it kind of gives us uh, a map of the, the ongoing battle. And uh, it allows to better understand uh, not necessarily the intentional strategies, but at least the effective uh, strategies, like in the end what's going on in this war. And uh, sort of the, 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 the insight that this gives us is that pro-vaccination are probably doing a, a very good job uh, at convincing the people that they reach out to, but they don't reach out to most uh, people. They, like they, they are kind of isolated, whereas uh, the anti-vaccination pages seem to be uh, well, better at infiltrating uh, different uh, all the web pages. So another thing that they did in, in the paper is that uh, well, they, they tried to model the, the dynamics of, the, of, of this battle, in a sense. And, um, and so they fit uh, some, some models. So the model is quite uh, sophisticated. Uh, well, it's quite hard to explain or, or just to understand. I <laughs> uh, well, didn't fully really understand it at all. Uh, but uh, it's essentially a model that tries to, to fit with the current uh, evolution of the dynamics uh, of the battle. 
and uh, then they did projections for the future based on the, the model. So it's sort of like saying like we have this. Well, the, the current situation seems to be uh, qu quite explainable by uh, by a certain dynamic, and then they projected this dynamic for the future. And what they observed, uh, what, what the, their model predicted, uh, is very concerning, uh, since uh, it, it raises the possibility that within a decade, anti-vaccination views may become predominant, uh, which would be uh, very, very bad uh, if, if this happens, arguably. Which brings us to maybe one experience we had, uh, me and I don't know for me, but whenever I presented our book projects or whenever I give a talk about uh, why we should care about robust recommender systems and why we should care about like robust machine learning for recommender systems. And I motivate that by vaccine, like up to, up to last year, people will tell me like, but this is not a big threat. Like, like this is, this is not a big deal, but uh, uh, arguably it's, it's growing, like it's potential of growth is scary. And we are seeing it now with, with, with COVID because uh, if it keeps growing, like now, now there are reports that the, the anti-vaccine movement is, gr like there is an anti-vaccine movement against an, a COVID vaccine. This is growing faster than researchers are, are getting closer to having a, a COVID vaccine. So by the time we would have a COVID vaccine, uh, you should expect that there would be already, that like communities, anti-vaccine communities would be already there, like would already have their, talking points and, uh, and their influence on social media would have been established. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, uh, like the, the stakes are, are high, uh, I, I think. Uh, and uh, especially uh, the COVID situation really uh, shows this, but more generally, uh, uh, well, health, public health is, uh, especially vaccines, uh, have saved uh, millions, uh, probably hundreds of millions of lives uh, in the last uh, decade or something like this. Uh, so yeah, we're talking about big, big numbers. And um, one of the key features of vaccination is uh, herd Im immunity. So herd immunity is the, the fact that if sufficiently, a sufficiently large proportion of the population is vaccinated, then it actually protects all of the, the population. And the reason for this has to do with uh, uh, the spread of of uh, of, uh, of a disease, uh, and the the, fam the famous uh, you've probably heard of the famous famous uh, uh, reproduction number by now, uh, this R RT, and uh, and this R number. Uh, if it's smaller than one, then the the pandemic just disappears by itself, uh, like it's exponentially uh, decaying, and so you save everybody. Uh, well not everybody because there's still few people who die because of this but you like 99.99 percent of the, the population is uh, is saved uh, but if this r number gets larger than one and if uh, and this happens if there are not sufficiently many people vaccinated then you have an exponential growth of, of the pandemic uh, and it can reach like 10 percent of the population and if uh, the virus is is uh, quite deadly this can represent uh, effectively uh, uh, well, millions, if not hundreds of millions of, of, of deaths. So I think that the stakes are high. And it's not only about public health, as we see uh, in the COVID situation, uh, like just trying to fight a pandemic uh, puts a lot of, of, of stress on different other parts of the society, uh, like for instance, economics. Uh, so uh, like unemployment has skyrocketed in the US and there's a, a lot of concerns about people not being able to afford a, a living in many countries in the world, uh, especially uh, developing countries. Uh, but also uh, it creates stress on, on and political tensions uh, and political decisions. And, uh, and th th there can be a lot, a lot of good coming out of this. Maybe this will question some, some bad ways of doing things but it can also uh, create bad situation. Like essentially a bad economics is, can cause some, something very bad in, in terms of politics and we have uh, historical examples of this. So arguably the stakes here are, are huge. Like we really, I think we're really talking about the future of mankind here in, in many regards. So one thing that uh, we're interested in doing is uh, somehow knowing how to fight uh, this, this this sort of misinformation and uh, and spread the the correct information. So, 
in the paper they they, they they mentioned that doing the mapping like they did and they uh, they also mentioned a few metrics like uh, measuring the centrality of a of a cluster so uh, of a facebook page somehow it says how much that facebook page can influence uh, other page around so, so correctly mapping the battlefield kind of help you change the way you communicate so tell you which page to target to better influence the this this battle that's happening uh, over this information and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and also like uh yeah, so, so there are different interesting insights, like another interesting insight from the paper, uh, which is more qualitative, but uh, I think it makes sense, is the idea that uh, uh, the anti-vaccination movement relies on many different narratives, and it suffices that one of these narratives, even though the narratives are, are, are mutually incompatible or something like this, it suffices that one of the narratives is convincing to uh, to, to, to one user or, or, or one cluster for this cluster to, to be convinced and to ad adopt it. So this is another way that this anti-vaccination movement can grow is by exploiting very different narratives. And it's, it's very hard to fight against all of these narratives at once uh, because there are multiple and you have to spend energy on each different narrative. Uh, and so this is an interesting insight to show that it, it's very, very hard to, to combat uh, these, uh, this mis misinformation. Yeah, yeah. In in our discussion, we uh, we agree that uh, features like uh, how pedagogical is some content and how engaging it is, not only how scientifically accurate the content is, the matters for for spreading uh, this kind of uh, information. So, if we if if you want to correctly inform people about vaccines, not only be scientifically accurate, but also try to be engaging and pedagogical, so that mm -hmm. the so that the message is heard, like you, you want to reach as many people as possible. And uh, for this uh, scientific accuracy is somehow boring and, uh, and hard to understand. And, uh, and so it won't spread and it, the message is usually not, not read as much. Yeah, and this may be uh, quite a big limitation in today's uh, strategy of, of, of pro-vaccination, let's say, or, or like I think more, more and more companies are, so for instance, if you search for uh, anti-vaccination on Facebook, well, at least when I did, like, I don't know uh, what you would get from your Facebook. Uh, not, not even anti-vaccination, if you just search for vaccine on Amazon, I, uh, like, uh, like if you search for like vaccine on Amazon books, you get anti-vaccine books. Yeah, uh, so, so maybe they've changed this. Uh, yeah, that was like, like in, uh, when we had the book online. So in November 2019, yeah, and I remember va vaccines on Amazon books give you anti-vaccine books. No, no, no yeah. anti or pro or just vaccines. Yeah, yeah. But but what I meant to say is that I think that there's a lot of work going on from Facebook, from YouTube, from Google, uh, and so on, mm -hmm. to try to remove uh, these contents. So when I searched uh, the other day, uh, anti-vaccination on Facebook, I was only recommended contents from World Health Organization, John Hopkins University, uh, well, still, uh, all of them, but still, from institutions. But then yeah. still, that's you searching for anti-vaccine. So yeah, 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 yeah. Of, of course, like it's only uh, my data, but I, I'm guessing that they've done quite some efforts from uh, uh, to, to to try to to, to promote more. Uh, uh, why, why I mentioned Amazon because I could this did this search from an. Uh, uh, an anonymous browsers without without being connected. Yeah, so it was not influenced by my profile or my. Yeah, idea. yeah, yeah. So, so I think that there needs to be a lot of work. Uh, like the, the the these recommendation platforms, they, they they they're not neutral. Like it, it's not clear what it means for them to be neutral. Um, like. On every topic, should you show 50-50 of every side of the, the question? Like if someone is searching one plus one equals two, like do you, are you going to show like half of the contents explaining why one plus one is not equal to two? Uh, probably not. Uh, and so, uh, and we be neutral, like, uh, like would we call it neutral to show 50-50 of uh, videos uh, saying that one plus one is not uh, equal to two? Uh, yeah, probably not. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, I, I think it, one important thing to, I think to, 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 to reflect on is that this concept of neutrality is a lot more complicated than this is than the, the, the simple idea that you should do 50-50 on both sides on every question. Uh, and, uh, and I think you should actually try to, to, to be more robustly beneficial given the stakes, uh, especially for, for this kind of, of topic where it's a matter of life and death and at, at large scale. Uh, and so you might say, uh, okay, so I'm going to try to, to, to shift uh, the battlefield, like to, to, uh, to, um, to, 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 to favor, uh, like for instance, scientific consensus. Uh, I don't think it would be that controversial, uh, for many topics at least. Uh, but uh, in any case, like this is something that uh, many uh, big social platforms are trying to move towards, uh, uh, at least from what they say, also from some results of, of queries I, I've made. But the concern I still have is that uh, the way they're doing this right now is by promoting uh, systematically contents from the big um, like John Hopkins or or from a uh, university or from uh, WHO. And the contents that's uh, spread by these uh, very trusted uh, or trustworthy uh, institutions is not the one that may be the most engaging or the most compelling. Uh, and instead of this, maybe if you get some influencers to, to convey the same message, it would be a lot more impactful. Of course, it's also harder to identify this kind of, uh, of content. Uh, from influencers, uh, because like it's it's easier to, to for for YouTube, for, for instance, to say, well, we just recommend systematically what WHO is saying, but it's arguably also less effective. Right? That's uh, what I meant to say. So it's a, a very complicated uh, topic overall. Uh, just the question of what should you recommend on on these uh, on on these platforms, and I think there needs to be a lot more research uh, in this direction. Yeah, and uh, adding to this, um, concerning what we discussed uh, last week about uh, somehow the backfire effect, the fact that if you want to show content saying uh, not X to someone that believes in X, it does not necessarily make them believe in not X uh, right away. And uh, in some cases, it can make them believe in what they believe in uh, even stronger by uh, opposition to, to, to what they are shown. So uh, as, as, as they say, so showing content from, uh, from the big groups uh, doing scientific research on vaccines it's not uh, totally obvious that it won't have this uh, this effect that people would uh, further distance to 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 what they read uh, because it's opposite to to what they currently they currently think. Yeah, yeah, and overall, it like intersects with a lot of different fields, but uh, understand the understanding the psychology of users and how they react to this or that kind of content, even though it's coming from WHO, from the World Health Organization. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very open question uh, and uh, we need better understanding of uh, how people react to science communication in general. We also discussed about uh, the possibility of uh, banning such uh, such Facebook page or such groups and that it, it might, it's, it sounds desirable, but it might not uh, not be fully effective. Like YouTube has been banning uh, some, some, uh, some creators, uh, especially far right, uh, uh, content creators um, and uh, well, also like recently you had this story of uh, of uh, Twitter uh, removing a tweet from uh, Donald Trump and then putting it back. Uh, so I, I think it's very complicated to and there's a, a huge backfire risk and in particular in the case of the far right uh, video content creators uh, a lot of them have uh, well, moved to another platform called uh, BitChute uh, and uh, and this well, if you just get when you when if you, when you uh, ban people, people still produce their content and they bring their followers with them to another platform. Then arguably, it's a huge cost in in, in the battle. I'd say because like you 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 are well, using a lot of the influence you could have had on these people, and. Um, in particular, the algorithmic recommendations or that could be made more beneficial on YouTube would have no effect on, on Bshoot, uh, for instance. So uh, th there's clearly this risk and people may even be more angry, more, 
uh, I think a lot of uh, the issue with uh, conspiracy theories and particular anti-vaccination is that they're often related to being uh, against the system in general or anti-authorities. Uh, and, and so you can imagine that uh, removing them uh, from this platform just justifies their narratives and will increase their influence uh, on other platforms. It's at least something to consider when you, uh, I think, uh, when you considering the possibility of uh, of banning people from platforms. Uh, next week we will discuss um, computable philosophy, which is a proposal, a course proposal by Lee and me, uh, in which we tackle some aspects in computing, computability, computer science, uh, the historical aspects of computing itself, and the the, the interlinks between computing and judgment and uh, stuff like that and why um, to actually just like why why computer scientists should care more about philosophy so if you want to, to give us another name okay see you next time so see you.